Hi, Clive. Good to be with you, and uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, starting off our presentation, uh, we'll skip a couple of slides in beyond the usual disclaimer. Really, what is Ricky about? Ricky is an infectious disease company in the midst of a global infectious disease crisis. We term the, uh, the term anti-infectives as really the umbrella over two major unmet medical needs, those falling beneath uh, the, within the antibacterial side of our business, being a new class of antibiotics, and, and under the antiviral pathogens, being a new class of antiviral um, compounds that are attracted to the proteinaceous or have an affinity to uh, attract and bind to the proteins of viral envelopes. Together, addressing the global health threat of anti-infectives. So where we are as a company is we are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and we are just last week have dual listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Our lead antibiotic compound is known as Recce 327 and that is focused on sepsis, septicemia or blood poisoning, the number one most expensive condition treated in health. That lead compound uh, has a qualified infectious disease designation, which is a legal status awarded by the US FDA, providing fast track regulatory review, plus 10 years of market exclusivity above and beyond our patent position. So a really unique, uh, a unique intellectual property right that this company has. We just recently have joined the S&P 500, which we're quite proud about if I say it. And we are very well funded, advancing a number of compounds through the regulatory process. Next slide. So as a snapshot of the company, the inventor is a uh, former head of research of Johnson & Johnson Australasia, executive director of their board of approximately 10 years. Uh, he uh, had a global responsibility, but with a particular focus on a third of uh, the region that we, we represent here today. He, in his retirement, with his pharmaceutical hat on and chemistry expertise, when I know this significant unmet medical need that existing antibiotics have not been able to address, and how can I create a compound to do that? So it's Dr. Melrose's invention having began with the end in mind and what he wanted, rather than what's uh, found in nature. As we built the company out around him, uh, we have behind some of these names some very large institutional funds, um, behind HSBC nominees is Fidelity, Fidelity International. Um, there's, you know, Wilson's Asset Management. I'm in there at number four. Uh, my background is actually the commercial side, although, of course, I represent all sides of the business. Uh, and I I've invested uh, in almost every capital round to date. Our cash position at this time is we have around 20-something uh, million cash at bank. Um, as our budgets uh, forecast, that's around three years of, of cash runway. I really see that more, more likely as around two, uh, and we typically have a good history of uh, raising capital on uh, not on a cash needed basis, but on a material event basis as you move from one stage in the company to the next stage. So therefore I see that about a two year horizon. We have no debt, uh, we wholly own our technology and at about 175 million market cap, we're advancing with our compounds. Next slide. Our, uh, really, our company is a sum of all parts. Uh, our chairman, Dr. John Prendigast, uh, joined us a couple of years ago. Uh, he is chairman of a New York Stock Exchange biotech company, lead director of a NASDAQ biotech company. And he actually approached us those couple of years ago saying, guys, you know, I'm a former Aussie. I did my doctorate at UNSW studying bacteria and blood diseases. You know, how can we work together? And we went, you know, you're just the person we, we seek to work, work with and is consistent with our uh, path of it, it beginning in Australia, expanding in the United States, and really broadening our, our um, portfolio around the infectious disease crisis that exists around us today. Uh, I come from the commercial side of things, obviously representing all sides of the business. I've been executive director of the board for five years and recently stepped into the role of CEO. Dr. Alan Dunton is a Wonderful addition to our team. His former head of research, global head of research of Janssen Research, which is Johnson & Johnson's R&D arm. He's responsible from going from concept to commercialization with three antibiotics. There's only ever been about 30 created. So he's a very unique uh, skill set to have around us. And Michelle Delizio, uh, of course, on the technical side as well as co-inventor and all the other wonderful skill sets around us. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a nice summary of really where we are as a company at this stage. 
We have two clinical assets, uh, as well as a number of other assets running following the preclinical path. We don't do research for research sake. All of our studies are what's called IND enabling studies or studies with the goal of getting into humans. Our first uh, key asset there is an intravascular uh, compound. It's basically a liquid formulation intravascularly infused into, into the veins. Um, it, why? Because sepsis is a, a bacterial blood disease and that's where it's easiest to target. We've completed all of the preclinical studies to do that. And as you'll see a little further in, we've announced a phase one human study happening in the background as we speak. Our topical administration is utilising the same compound in a spray on solution, getting on top of the broad spectrum nature of, anti of, of bacteria that exists in burns wounds and particularly led by Professor Fiona Wood, former Australian of the year for her burns work. Viral indications working with the best of government here in Australia and a number of leading institutes overseas and Murdoch Children's Research Institute for Helicobacter pylori, which is an oral, uh, oral solution for the bad bacteria that exists in the upper duodenum, avoiding the good bacteria that exists in the lower. In the lower. We talk a little more about that further in. Next slide. So why are we different? So on the antibiotic side of things, all existing antibiotics are naturally derived. They're bacterial fungi, they're cultivated out, and they're put against whatever bacterial or fungi you're competing against. Basically, it's like a lock and a key. You've got the bacteria, you've got the antibiotic. Today, they come together and the antibiotic works. Tomorrow, when that bacteria is wised up to survive, that lock and key mechanism no longer works. So with these fundamentals in mind, Dr. Melrose began how can I design a compound that overcomes that cellular mutation, that's attracted to the proteins of the bacteria and interacts with unique cellular structures, unique to those bacteria without harming the healthy human cells? And most importantly, keep on working with repeated use, whilst also in the process, removing a lot of the unwanted compounds that come with traditional drugs. So we've really uh, tried to recreate nature, but empower ourselves by having the optimum product or starting from a position of power, meaning we'll keep on working with repeated use. And that's something our technology represents today. Next slide. So our prime uh, focus, or really I think we're a sum of all parts in our uh, portfolio approach, but one of those is sepsis, septicemia or blood poisoning. Basically any bacteria that gets in the blood from be it a scratch or an operation spreads very, very quickly. Currently, there's around 50 million cases worldwide every year, or one in five result in death. Now, that's terrible in modern medicine as we know it, or one in three in hospitals. It is the number one most expensive condition treated in health. In fact, in the United States, it costs around half a million dollars, US dollars, per patient to treat. There are currently no drug therapies specifically for sepsis. The reason you have such a high death rate is that the patient presents a clinician says, hey, mate, you've got sepsis, but I don't know what type of bacteria. We'll do a blood draw, we'll cultivate it out, and we'll come back and try to work out what type of bacteria you've got and what type of antibiotic it's susceptible to. Until then, it's guesswork. So they put in a cocktail of antibiotics. I've had it up in a sepsis patient. And if that antibiotic for that type of bacteria, the guesswork is wrong, the outcome of the patient is no good. So we, in a, beginning with the end in mind, have sought to create a compound that works against any bacteria in the blood, because any bacteria there is bad bacteria, and we want to still kill it. And that is uh, why we've got an ability against a broad range of uh, bacteria. Next slide. So recently, uh, only last week or so, we were recognised in the Global Antibiotic Pipeline, which is um, monitored or created by Pew Charitable Trusts. Uh, there is 36 new drug candidates under clinical development between phase one and phase three in that pipeline. There hasn't been a new class of antibiotic in over 30 years. So if any one of these six get it, that'd be great. But as you'll see on this page, we're the only synthetic antibiotic in the world in phase one clinical development. And uh, we are the only compound for sepsis. So there's quite a bit of weight on our shoulders to achieve there, but we're very pleased to be recognized as such. Next slide. Uh, this is our phase one human clinical study happening in Adelaide. It's a phase one human study. It's 48 or so healthy individuals, dose escalation. You're looking at safety parameters. Basically, how much can you put in the blood without recognising an overdose? 
uh, to monitor where a, a toxicity is and where a therapeutic element is. Currently, our therapeutic uh, indication is very low, so that window between the two is the absolute goal. Next slide. Uh, this is an example. I'll just breeze over this. Basically, on the left-hand side of screen, you see against MRSA, 10 out of 10 with ours survived, 9 out of 10 with oxacillin. Well, obviously, that's 100 in every 1,000 patients not having a particularly good outcome. Uh, what's important here is oxacillin is the best against MRSA. Could have been streptococcus pyogenes or any other type of bacteria. Even against the best th therapeutic alternative, we still outperformed. Next slide. This is just an example of some of the studies uh, we've done to date, or what's called IND enabling studies, which is regulatory focused. Uh, here is dose escalations in rats in this instance, a small species. And what you see in the upper columns there of uh, groups of animals at 4,000 milligrams per kg, not just one day, but each day therein thereafter for around at least seven days. Um, what you're really looking at is a no observed adverse effect level which at around 500 milligrams per kg is a very ha happy comfort zone intravascularly infused, where we get efficacy at about that 50 to 100 megs, so you got a nice window. Next slide. And this is an extended version of it in dogs. They're slightly more susceptible, but you get the same thing. Next slide. This is uh, one that I personally get quite excited about because firstly, I have the privilege of working with uh, Professor Fiona Wood, who's former Australian of the Year for her Burns work. Uh, we have uh, our compound uh, in Fiona Stanley Hospital uh, with Professor Fiona and her esteemed colleagues uh, utilising our compound on their vulnerable Burns patient population. Really that for the first time you see whether you can um, support these patients who have been perhaps drug resistant to existing antibiotics, are burdened by major um, uh, burns infections currently. And when you can, can see that at a therapeutic level and potentially extrapolate that into world, real world outcomes, I think you start to see some real clinical first. So that I, I anticipate some very uh, interesting uh, news over the time ahead. Next slide. This is an example of just some of the efficacy. Uh, here against the best in class in that space, they got dosed twice daily, we got dosed once daily. We still uh, reduced the bacterial concentration for, uh, at a better rate than they did. And when we look to the right hand side of screen, how do we go in assisting in wound closure or wound contraction? We did better than they again there too. So a very positive indication. Next slide. Uh, this is our uh, Helicobacter pylori program at Murdoch Children's Research Institute. It's an oral dosing program. Uh, we're doing the usual preclinical studies there. If successful, uh, we would seek in Q4 of this year to have a third clinical trial, which would be an oral dosing trial. Next slide. Here you can see uh, the existing best therapy is a combination therapy. Uh, we significantly outperformed that using our just uh, single dosing therapy. And if we go to the next slide, which is probably the what I find the most interesting about this, and we talked about beginning with the end in mind, this compound is 100% soluble at all pHs. pHs of the blood to the opposite acidity of the stomach. The bad bacteria exists in the upper duodenum, the good bacteria exists in the lower. Our compound is designed to break down in the stomach acid so that when it gets down through the GI tract to the good bacteria, it no longer has an antibacterial effect. Demonstrating that you've got two, uh, groups of mice here, one group had water twice daily. The other group had quite a high concentration of our compound twice daily, and they still put on the same body weight. They still eat the same, put on the same body weight, go through all their traditional little animal habits. And, and that's a very positive indication because if they took another compound, they probably would have bombed out the uh, good bacteria and have terrible diarrhea and all the other negative side effects. Next slide. Uh, our MR, uh, sorry, our, our COVID program, priority one test candidate with a leading institution here in Australia. Uh, next slide shows that we achieved a 99.9% viral uh, inhibition against uh, the coronavirus itself. Most importantly, with a very positive safety window, meaning um, the virus was no longer detected at 4,000 milligrams per kg with very, very minimal toxicity to the healthy cells. Next slide. 
Here we've done it in uh, hamsters. That's a nasal administration. So getting into the viral teeters in the uh, hamsters, sinuses, and we're doing that in ferrets as we speak. Next slide. We work on all the uh, bad bacteria. These are the top five designated by uh, World Health. We work with the same concentration in the same time, whether it's the standard form or the superbug form. Next slide. Most importantly, we keep on work, working with repeated use when others do not. We'll go to the next slide. We'll brief over the next three slides. These are just visual examples of it interacting with E. coli cells. You basically cause the cells to burst through interacting with the high metabolic processes that exist within those cells and are unique to those cells. Next slide. This is probably the slide that I'll conclude on. Uh, in essence, what we have is as a new synthetic anti-infective, our, our space has been a land grab. So we have composition of matter patents, which in family one have a curative claims and manufacturing claims. Family two, um, uh, preventative claims, as well as dose administration. So intravascular, oral, nasal, inhaler, so on. And in family three, our antiviral claims. These take us out to uh, very late in 2037 and above and beyond that position, we have government backed market exclusivity for our sepsis application in the United States. So I guess in summary, what it really means is we've got a company with a world first technology, two clinical programs working in parallel, multiple news flow events uh, working from now and, and into the future. We are not raising capital. We are very fun well funded to um, support our clinical programs. And as an infectious disease company in the midst of an infectious disease crisis, we are getting ahead with these world first indications and we welcome you to join us on that journey. Thanks for listening.